Hello everyone, and welcome to episode number 10 of Liner Notes. Thank you, as always, for listening and supporting the podcast. Very excited about releasing this week's episode, as it is the very first conversation I've had with my guest not being based in the UK, which means Liner Notes has gone international. My guest on this episode is Gary Scheiman. Gary is a film, TV and video game composer with over 20 years experience in the industry, which means he knows it pretty much inside out and that really comes across in the chat that we had. I know after listening back that he had to dumb it down a bit for me as I have very little technical musical knowledge or ability. Suffice to say, I spent the whole 45 minutes making mental notes of things to look up after we finished the chat. So thank you to Gary for both his time and his patience during this conversation. Now I hope you'll enjoy listening to Gary as much as I did. I could have quite easily picked his brains for the whole day, but I had to condense our conversation down as much as possible, so that's why it's about 45 minutes long. I've tried my best to touch on lots of different topics, so hopefully there is something here for everyone. Now, without any further hesitation, here's the conversation I had with Gary Scheiman on Liner Notes. So, uh, so this is it. We're now live, and I have the absolute pleasure of chatting to Mr. Gary Scheiman. Welcome, Gary. How are you doing? Uh, it's great to be here. Um, pleasure to speak with you, James. Super. Thank you. So um, before we get into our conversation, would you mind just giving a basic introduction, a teaser, if you will, of just kind of who you are, what you do? Well, I'm a composer for, I, I like to say, for audiovisual media. I've been uh, writing music for a very long time, since the 80s. I uh, started uh, back working for Mike Post and P. Carpenter, working on ch- television shows like The A-Team and um, Magnum P.I. and whatever, and uh, continued. And then perhaps best known these days for my work in video game scoring um, with uh, the video games for uh, Destroy All Humans, all three of those, uh, Bioshock, all the Bioshock games, uh, 1, 2, and Infinite, and um, uh, also the Mordor games, uh, um, Shadow of of, uh, War and Shadow of Mordor, uh, and many other. So just uh, had a a great last uh, 14, 15 years of having a fantastic creative opportunity in scoring games. Just just sat here and listening to you read those things out. It's just it's such a wonderful CV. That's uh, that's so that's so impressive. Do, do you do you kind of see it that way? Oh well, uh, you know, I, I've always been just grateful that uh, I'm writing music and making a living in this creative way that I love. You know, and so I, I don't. You know, um, I certainly doesn't impress my wife and son all that much. <laughs> <laughs> they, don't, they don't treat me with uh, as much respect as I do. But <clears throat> no, I'm, I, you know, look, I'm very lucky. and I've had a lot of great scoring experiences and gotten to work with a lot of fantastic musicians and orchestras and you name it. And, 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 and I still and I score beyond uh, games. I scored a film last year and 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 um just started, just starting literally this year, a, a, a new game project. Uh, so I'm, I'm very uh, lucky and blessed to have these opportunities. And, and yeah, the experiences I've had have been really uh, interesting and varied. And I love the varied nature of it because I, I don't think of myself as uh, just writing one style of music. I may be best known with Bioshock and Don Day's Inferno and some other games is writing the scary dark music, but really um, that's by far not, not all that I've been fortunate enough to, uh, to write music for. So. Sure. And I, and I really, I really can't wait to kind of get into those things, but before we do, I just want to ask something that I'm not sure I've not heard in any interviews with you 
before and maybe you have answered it but i just want to talk a little bit about growing up and, and whether you grew up in a musical environment if i may well, um, my mother and father were not musical. My father's family were a family of musicians. His, his, my grandmother's uh, generation on my dad's side were all professional musicians, actually. Um, although I have never, I have never been convinced that you that you inherit musical talent or abilities or whatever. Um, obviously, you could be influenced to be in music by having a parent who you know, loves music and teaches you how to play an instrument or whatever. <clears throat> and, and, but I mean, if you look at some of the great composers, uh, uh, you know, classical composers, some of them had, their parents had no musical talents whatsoever. Look at Gustav Mahler or something like that. I mean, just, just really, he just sort of blossomed out of thin air. So I, I don't know that, that that is critical. I just fell in love with music, started playing piano as a, a teenager, of about 14 and just, and got so involved in playing. I was practicing four hours a day, almost every day, because I just fell in love with it. And then when I went to school, I uh, just gravitated towards uh, composition and ended up uh, graduating from the University of Southern California uh, with a degree in music comp. Uh, and, you know, but knowing that my interest was not in you know, concert music, um, so much as it was in scoring. Um, and I came out of USC with the desire to start a career as a film and TV composer, because this is the eighties and there was really no opportunity. The gaming was not a, an opportunity back then for a composer because it was so primitive relative to where it is now. And in fact, you couldn't even use recorded scores in games until uh, the nineties. So. Does that, does that answer your question? Kind of, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Quick um, yeah. So w was it when you started with the piano that something kind of clicked in your head that maybe you'd want to follow it into a career or was it a little bit later that that idea of a career kind of formed? I think it was later. Uh, I just loved playing the piano and I love classical music to be honest um, and pop music as well, but more classical was what I spent my time practicing. And I was, I was an okay pianist, no, no concert level skills or abilities, but just okay. But that was good enough for me because I just loved playing it, you know? And then when I went, went to school, it just, it dawned on me. I wasn't initially, um, before I went to USC, I went to Sonoma State in Northern California for, for a, um, uh, two years. And then I transferred to USC. And all I was taking was uh, music classes. That's all I wanted to take. So it was it was almost like the, it, I was drawn to it in an inescapable way. And I now, you know, I teach uh, one day a week at USC now in the screen scoring program. You know, and I tell the I tell y young um, composers that you really have to want to do this very badly. It's super competitive. It's just insanely competitive and difficult to uh, to get opportunities. So you just have to want to do it so badly that you're willing to take the risk, you know, of, uh, you know, never fulfilling it, but you're just so, um, so uh, interested and focused and passionate about doing this that you're willing to take that risk. And I did, and, and it worked out. Sure. It's a very high risk, high reward sort of scenario to be in, isn't it? Absolutely. So um, talking about opportunities as you were there, you, you mentioned at the start you came out of USC and started working uh, on shows like uh, Magnum PI and the A-Team. And the A-Team especially is such an iconic, certainly iconic American show. H how was it to be given that opportunity pretty much out of the blocks? Oh, it was, it was fantastic. Although, I, you know, I, I've told this story before, but I remember it, the, the two main composers were... Uh, Mike Post and Pete Carpenter, and they had they were a team, but they had so many TV shows. They were so successful that they were hiring guys like myself. There's like three of us that were helping them because they were, they were literally doing four scoring four shows a week, and so they couldn't possibly, particularly back then, everything was orchestral. We had an orchestra, and we had you had to show up and you had to write every note on the paper on a piece of paper that you know got got sent to a copyist and ended up on the stands 
a few days later. So there's just no way to accomplish that. So we were uh, a team and I remember uh, we went uh, over to uh, Mike's house and we were watching the, uh, the pilot for a team. And we all thought it was like, we thought this show is never going to last. This is, this is so <laughs> goofy. You know, we just thought it was kind of goofy. And um, we were, we all just had bets on how many episodes it, it would. And then, it, and then it blew up and became a success. So it shows what we knew. We knew, you know, nothing. And no, you know, so uh, it, it was, uh, it was, it was a great, it was, you know, they had written a really cool theme for the show. And we used the theme, but you know, you didn't, you couldn't always use the theme. You just use it when appropriate moments, you know, and it was just great. It was a great opportunity to write orchestral music and get it performed every few days, literally every week. You would show up at a studio. Composers, young composers these days rarely get a chance to work with orchestras. So for me, it was like totally amazing, you know, um, but it was much more common back then if you were working. It was, it was, there was a much smaller group of composers back then. Now there's so many people interested in this profession from all over the world coming to LA, but then it was a small niche kind of business with a few people. Even then it was difficult, but it, um, it, it was, it was just a small um, niche industry the people interested in, and talented and creative and, you know, back then the barriers were higher too, because you really had to know how to write music and orchestrate um, music. Uh, and now you don't have to know how to do that. It, it's all, so much of it is done in computers and software. And then if you have, even if you don't know, I mean, there's, there's famous composers uh, like Hans Zimmer who, who admit publicly that they don't, they don't, you know, really write music in the traditional way, uh, paper and pencil, they, they, this, they do it using computer and, and as most people do now, actually, including myself, but back in those days, you had to have the, all the skills that, uh, being hot, very trained and, you know, really almost everyone had been to a university and studied music composition. There were exceptions, but you know, so. It was, it was just, it was a great time, the 80s. You know, it was a golden era of scoring for TV and film. Uh, someone once said that no, when you're actually in a golden era, you don't know it. <clears throat> but uh, yeah. it was just, a, it was just the way it was. And uh, it was, it was very cool. Sure. So just kind of setting the scene, obviously a young composer, fresh out of USC, composing for the A-team. And and how was it kind of hearing hearing your scores on telly? Kind of how quick was the turnaround? Was it kind of the next week, the next month? Yes, yes. You'd you'd like you you'd meet like on a Monday and spot maybe or maybe the Friday before, and then you'd spot. Spotting means you find out where you you decide you make the creative decision of where where does music. Where are the music spots or where do you find, where does music start to stop within this episode? Because it's not preordained, you know, it's just, they send you the episode and you have to make, and there's a music editor there who takes notes and then you get those notes in the form of like cue sheets and those, um, those get divided amongst a group of composers, maybe three people score the episode because there's, you know, 25 or 30 minutes of music and you get those maybe Saturday or Sunday, and then you have like three days to write your, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of music. And then, you know, come Thursday or Friday, you're in the studio recording it. And then the next week it's on the air. Brilliant. Yeah, it was really quick turnaround. Sure. And, and how is it kind of with the people around you being able to kind of show them that this was your music being played nationally on this uh, on this iconic show? Well, we did, I mean, it was just another TV show to us. It wasn't uh, sure, it's yeah. become iconic <laughs> in, uh, in retrospect, but it was, yeah, it was, it was great. I mean, for me, it was cool to have my, my music in my early twenties, you know, uh, on television and making money and showing my parents that, you know, Hey, you didn't waste all this money at USC. Um, I'm actually able to make a living as a composer. So it was, it was great. It was fantastic. I was, I was very, very lucky and, uh, and happy to have that opportunity. Yeah, for sure. So, so just kind of 
fast forwarding a little bit now and kind of dipping into the video game starting era, which was uh, about the mid 90s, I think, was it for you? Yeah, my first game was in the mid '90s. It was uh, it was uh, Voyeur for uh, Philips Interactive. Sure, um, and that was that was a uh, a cool game. It was really the gaming wasn't nearly as interesting as it became later in the decade and in, and into this uh, century, shall we say? Uh, it was Philips had these this hardware um, platform. Um, called CDI and you and basically it was like video trees you and and so scoring it was really like scoring like little scenes from a film uh, and and because of that that technology permitted a composer like myself who was really not into writing like little MIDI you know mono MIDI parts or, or um, single line MIDI parts that got performed by in an in app or in hardware um, synthesizer, you know, it was a actually, I actually recorded an orchestra for, for the, um, for the Voyeur game. Yeah. So that was, that made sense for me. And I, a friend of mine actually was working at uh, Phillips and he hired me and then Phillips went out of business. And so I really, you know, didn't score any video games then for about a decade until 2004. Sure, and, and can we just talk about that time that you kind of returned into that video game, uh, video game kind of sense, uh, and um, and what were your kind of first thoughts when you when you first started picking up these games and and seeing what what could be achieved with the the new technology and that sort of thing? It was I was uh, I was bowled over. I was really impressed with the technology, even in two thousand and four, and that's you know now what, fourteen fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, the technology had advanced dramatically and I was not a gamer. I was not playing video games. So I was totally sort of unaware. I mean, I knew that they existed, but I wasn't aware of how interesting they'd gotten. So when I had the opportunity through sheer serendipity and luck to work on Destroy All Humans, I was like, I was like, holy cow, this is amazing. And I, I wanted to play games and I, and I did start playing games um, after that because I was just so bowled over by how cool the technology had become and and because it, and it was also then and of course this continues now a very interesting um way to uh to work um that there's this whole new opportunity for composers and video games was the future and uh and it really has you know, I, I was saying that to people and they were going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it really has become, it's, it's much larger than the film industry now and television. It's just, it's massive. And uh, so I, I just got lucky. And then once I saw how cool it was, I totally pursued it. I was really interested in the industry and the opportunities. And, and I loved working with the video game teams. They're just really, really great people to work with, um, down to earth. Yes, they, that, you know, it wasn't like you could just do whatever you wanted, uh, you know, but they, they didn't have the sort of uh, ego sure. and kind of, it was, it was just a much more pleasant environment for, uh, for composers. Let's put it that way. Sure. And I imagine that in itself breeds a lot more creativity when you're kind of scoring these things, if you're not feeling as, as kind of pinned down, should we say? Absolutely. It, it just, it just, you know, I just, I personally work a lot better when I'm working with people who are want to be creative and, and really are open to really different ways of, uh, and, and really more daring ways of scoring and I found that in the video game industry, I found that I found partners, at least for me, the kind of games that I was getting hired for were super creative and gave me opportunities. And, and by, by, um, by the late nineties and early two thousands, orchestras had become much less common in television, which was still my primary, primary way of making a living. So all of a sudden here I was in video games and I got to do and work with, you know, uh, orchestras again 
and, and I love that. I love, I love doing that. So it, and, and the compensation was very fair and very, you, know, you, you were well paid for your work. Although the one big business difference is there's no back end. When you do television, you receive royalties when it plays on TV, you know, when it's broadcast, you don't get much back end from games. So that's maybe the only downside. Not it's not a creative issue, but it is a purely um, business aspect. <clears throat> yeah, sure, that makes sense. So, so obviously you mentioned destroy all humans then, and it's not something I've personally played, but I understand it's kind of like this sandbox, almost kind of free for all style game. Yeah, I mean there are goals. There's levels and there's goals. Sure. And I'm, I haven't played the game for a very long time, but you know you're basically gathering. DNA data or DNA from human brains or whatever as you destroy mankind. It's a tongue in cheek yeah. game where you play like a little alien coming to Earth in the 1950s. Um, and so they, and, and the cool thing about it was that they wanted kind of a sci fi 50s sound a la Bernard Herman's score for the day the Earth stood still. So I love Bernard Herman. So writing in a quasi Bernard Herman style was a blast. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it was just kind of a fun, you know, and it was a hit. It was a successful game, which was also very cool. And the score was successful and got actually got nominated, didn't win any awards, but got nominated, which I was thrilled as well. Brilliant. So in, in terms of scoring something like that, something that's essentially open-ended, how, how does that vary to scoring like a, a film or TV show, which is very linear, the story's already set? Whereas with a game, the player is very much in control. How, how do you go about making music for specific moments? and Or, or do you? Well, yeah, I, um, that obviously is the big difference between scoring a film or a game or a television show and film sort of are the same in terms of you have a set scene and imagery that's locked and edited, and then you score it. And that's frozen and mixed with the sound effects and dialogue and, you know, but in games, obviously, players have free agency and can go left or right or turn around or leave a room or you know, do whatever. So that is the main difference. Now, I would say what we were doing, what I was doing on Destroy Humans was, um, you know, modest in terms of a lot of the techniques that uh, have been developed and that I've worked with. Um, since then, but it was basically lots of looping music. A, pe a loop is a piece of music that just, you know, lasts for one to three minutes and then replays. Sure. But they were also, um, they were layered in as much as um, you had different in intensities as you wandered around and different sort of either you, you could, you would show yourself as a uh, alien. That was one style. If you were, hidden as a human that was into the music was a different feel and then if you're in combat there was combat music and a lot of combat music uh, and the music was just looping and so you weren't catching specific events i was very used to that that was like my uh, that was what composers did you're matching music precisely to visual imagery and um you're not catching everything as you you know we call that in a you might in a cartoon catch almost everything, you know, but you don't want to do that in film and TV normally. Um, and, but you still, you're, you're able to catch certain important events or subtle things that you feel are important, but you don't do that in a game because nobody's experience is precisely the same. Everyone has a unique uh, gaming experience. And so nothing will time out precisely. So you're writing sort of music that has the right vibe, for what the player is doing at that moment, like combat or whatever. And then there's, there are ways to hit certain events. Like if a player, you know, kills the boss and the boss battle knocks, you, you can have the music transition to a stinger that, you know, yay kind of music. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. So there's, there are a number of techniques you can use so that the player feels like their own experience is being scored. <clears throat> brilliant that's that's like it sounds like there's so there's kind of there's almost two schools of music there's that kind of quite generic music that can be played in those obviously specific moments like combat but in a in any kind of combat and then there's those set things that picks up 
those dedicated pieces of music like the boss things you said so there's almost those two different types is that kind of accurate yeah i mean uh, there there are there are just moments that you want to catch and so those moments can be caught in a number of ways you can transition very quickly to another piece of music or you can add what's called a stinger like a piece of music that just hits some event and the game you know the game's um uh, Intel knows what the player is doing, okay? Um, so it has AI, it has artificial intelligence, it knows where the player is, it knows if a player opens a door, and, and at that point, maybe the music starts, you know? Or And then when you go inside the door and you're wandering around the house and you open another door and a zombie jumps out at you, it knows when that happens, and at that point, you may have, so you may have, you may open the door, enter the house, and you may want to have some sort of ambient, kind of eerie music, um, and then when the door to the zombie closet opens and it jumps out at you, you may want to hit that and change moment, uh, on an instant to something quite frightening and, you know what I mean, and intense. So the, there's many techniques like that, that that permit the composer and the game develop, developer to um, precisely kind of catch um, events. But, but I, I mean, there and there's also um, in-game um, cinematics, you know, uh, where you are playing the picture where, you know, you finish a boss battle and, and you finish a level and now you watch a little in-game CGI movie. And then those are scored just like you would a film or a television show. Um, and then, and yeah, depending on the style of the game, you may have just sort of general looping music that just sort of like kind of plays along with, with the player, whatever is happening. So it, it, it really varies uh, quite substantially uh, based on the style of the game, the, what the developer wants, what they're looking for, you know. But there's definitely a number of techniques that are sort of uni universally used, like layered music and stingers and, you know, and looping music, which is super common. Sure, yeah, that, that makes absolute sense. Um, and then, and then we kind of move on to the the slightly newer releases. So obviously, you then progressed onto Bioshock series one, two, and Infinite at the start. And I want to focus on Infinite specifically, uh, with that being the last of the series, and that had pretty much brilliant reviews across the board. As it is a is a fantastic game. Uh, obviously, the music uh, for that is fantastic as well. Uh, did you kind of know at the time? Uh, did the team know that you'd really kind of got on something and you really kind of cracked something open that was uh, that was going to be a bit of a hit? Well, obviously, the f the first game was the surprise because we no one knew whether that was going to be a big hit or not. We hoped, of course, sure. and we were trying to make the best game we could. But Infinite, Bioshock 2 was not made by uh, Irrational Games and Ken Levine. But Bioshock Infinite was. So it was the second game from Irrational. And expectations were very high, you know, so we were certainly hoping. Um, and it took a very long time to produce that game. And it went through a lot of changes and incarnations and, and you know, shifts. And so you never know. You just never know. And, and certainly I'm what's called a contracted employee, meaning that I'm not in-house. I'm not sort of watching the game and you know on the meetings i'm they, they were all in boston and i was dealing with the music director um remotely by phone or whatever you know emails <clears throat> so i was uh you know not able to judge as the game was being produced how um how good or bad or indifferent uh, but i was seeing gameplay and it was looking amazing it was looking very cool so my my hope was that it was going to be a, a, a big hit but it, it turned out to be a wonderful hit um and so you know but you never know what you you know you can say the same thing in film i mean there's these there's some famous bombs that studios spent hundreds of millions of dollars making and everyone expected to be successful that, that were just absolute, you know, junk. And then other smaller projects that, that turned out brilliantly. So you just never know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things you kind of got to wait for it to, uh, to hit the masses and then wait for their, wait for their thoughts really, haven't you? Yeah, because I'm, and I'm not playing, I'm not really playing the game. <clears throat> They're sending me gameplay, uh, capture footage videos. 
so to, to help me score certain parts of the game. But basically, they're telling me we need this kind of music for this moment in the game. So I'm getting sort of hints, but I'm not e even getting a complete understanding of all the nuances of the game, you know? So I'm doing the best I can with the information I have. And then of course they're listening and approving or not approving and giving me feedback. So it's really not until you play the game that you go, wow, okay, now I see how this all fits together. But the people in house have a better sense of it. But even they, none of them, you never really fully comprehend how things are going to turn out until the very, the, it really is finished and you can play it and you go, wow, okay, I, I totally get it now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes sense. And, um, and I mean, that was kind of quite a big step as, as a game. Um, and, and I mean, even since then, in those five years, we've progressed even further. I saw the, uh, the your kind of release, your newest release, Torn. Um, that's kind of a VR based game, isn't it? Is that right? Yes. Yes. It's a VR game and it's brilliantly made. And, uh, really, I loved working on that game. Um, and yeah, that's, I mean, that the technology with via VR, you know, VR has not quite taken off as, as many expected it would, but I think now finally the hardware is coming out that may make it um, accessible for many more people because there's inexpensive 200 to $250, you know, I, I think uh, Facebook um, uh, is coming out with their, their latest um, VR setup for like, on like 200 or $250. And it's, you know, pretty good. It's pretty darn good. So it's really, I think when the hardware yeah. gets there and it's affordable, um, then you'll have enough people with VR hardware to justify the expense of the, you know, major publishers and developers wanting to make these really nuanced, awesome games and spend the money because it's a, a chicken and egg kind of situation. But, but I, I torn was great. Torn was a, is a really brilliant game and uh, I had a fantastic time scoring it. Yeah. So obviously that's quite a huge leap from Bioshock infinite, which I mean, it's only five years ago, but that initially came out on, on PS3 and or, or Xbox 360, I should say. Um, and now we're kind of into this VR world. How, how has music scoring for video games changed in those five years? Because obviously the visual aspect has changed so much. What, what kind of from the audio side has changed for you? Well, VR ha um, ultimately has not changed um, music that much, really. There's because what you're still, it's still um, assuming the same function. Um, and you could, because of the potential, you could have uh, uh, a sound or a, a, an orchestral element or a synthesizer sound spinning around your head, but there's no, there, it, that doesn't really do anything but distract, you know? So really the music is still a stereo field in right in front of you. Now, if you have some diegetic source coming from something in game, like a record player or radio, then that's going to be in its proper place in the, in the spatial world that you're in, but not, um, not music. So really the, it wasn't radically different. It was just a matter of finding the right music that felt right uh, emotionally when, you know, certain aspects of the game or you, you, um, you, uh, you know, you get to a certain spot, you open a certain room or some event occurs that is, that gets scored. From my perspective, there's no radical change in the way music is written or functions. Is there anything kind of from a technology point of view that has made, made maybe writing easier in those five years? Or, or is it still kind of pretty much how it was when you, when you scored those games, Bioshock? Well, I mean, there's always new uh, sounds and the applications that we work with get more sophisticated, but nothing earth shaking. That I mean, the, the samples and the synthesizers are get better every year. And yet, I had an orchestra for Torn, and there's nothing sounds better than a real orchestra. And I have the latest, greatest sounds, and I have, and I 
have a huge template of, of sounds that I work with, but nothing sounds better than real humans, which I am happy about really, because I love writing for, for, you know, for an orchestra still. I don't, I don't know if that'll be around in 30 years or 40 years. Um, it, it may not, but at least for my career, it has been around and I, and I just love writing for it. Sure. So, so do you find when you're sat in front of the orchestra that, that you can kind of hold all the different layers in your head? Because for someone, for the uninitiated like me, that sounds like uh, I'd just be tired just thinking about it. But is it, is it quite an easy thing for you to be able to split apart the layers and kind of either add more or add less of something? Yeah, I mean, when you're actually recording a particular piece of music, you're not thinking about the layers. You, but if, for instance, there's there's a cue that where there's three layers, but and I recorded each one separately. So when you're recording that particular part of the music, it's directly related. It, there's notes on the page, and you're recording it just as you would any score. Um, so no, it, it was not particularly. Uh, it was not particularly difficult for me, and I've just I have a lot of experience doing it. So for me, it's just it's. Um, what I do and what I what I've trained for and what I uh, understand from a whole lifetime of of uh, experience. So no, it's it's not uh, particularly challenging any more than it. It's always challenging conducting an orchestra and getting a good performance. And the, and I do like to conduct, so I conduct my own music. So that's always a challenge. But it's it's like the fun part of the process. You, the hard part is like sitting in front of the computer going what I do here what what music is right you know and, and it's, that's like the blank page that's the struggle part but once you've done that and it's been approved because you you do what's called mock-ups you know um, you, you make it sound as good as you can within the computer and then it gets approved so once it's approved and, and everybody loves it and now it's just a matter of like wow let's make it sound fantastic then it's then that is really the fun part of the whole process really that's just where you're, you're a kid in the candy shop. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great analogy. Um, and in terms of producing music and scoring music, have you ever had the desire to kind of create something that's your own body of work and not necessarily linked to another project? Because obviously soundtracks are kind of the accompaniment to the visual aspect of film, TV, games. Would you ever want to release kind of like an orchestral classical album or something like that? Or, or are you very much soundtrack? Well, I wrote a viola concerto. And it was performed uh, like a couple year, a year and a half ago um, in LA at the Anson Ford Theater, an open air theater in the summer, and it was it was a wonderful experience. Um, <clears throat> I'm writing some music now uh, for a project that really gives me that sort of creative opportunity. Although it will have a commercial purpose in the end. Um, but no, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm mostly satisfied with writing music, um, for film and, and games. Uh, I mean, that's pretty satisfying, but I do occasionally get the opportunity to, uh, to write something that's not for that purpose. And it's, yeah, I still do very much enjoy that. Sure. Brilliant. And, and in terms of uh, the projects that you may or may not be working on. I appreciate that you probably can't share too many details. But in an ideal world, if something kind of came along that was to tick all the boxes for you, how how would that kind of look? What sort of thing would be your ideal next project, if you could? Well, the, the best is when you have a really creative team that's making, let's say, as we're talking about games, it could be, this could be true of a film uh, as well, or a television show. When you have like a really fantastic creative team that is really going after something, you know, wonderful and beautiful or unique. And that's, that's the best. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in any one style or, or whatever, you know, I've always said that I want to score a Western and, and I've never have, <clears throat> but, um, I mean, I, it, if the team is creative, then I'll get into it. And that's the best. And I've done games and, or, and projects where the teams have been, you know, okay, but not, not like a Ken Levine experience where Ken is making a Bioshock, something that radically cool and, and unique, you know? So that's the best when the team is like super creative, super talented, um, 
really wanting to make something special and pushing me and challenging me to, to participate in, in that really super creative way. That's the best. That's the, that's the killer. That's the kid in the candy shop moment, I imagine. Amazing. So as we're kind of coming towards the end of the conversation now, I just want to give you a chance to maybe list out for the listeners a few of your favorite kind of artists, a few of your favorite composers, people that you think people should be checking out, maybe a few ones to watch. Who, who kind of immediately springs to mind for you? Well, um, you know, I mean, in terms of film, I'm I'm a huge fan of John Williams. I still think there's no one. I mean, I know that it, it's sort of an easy fallback, but there is no one who does what he does better. He is like the greatest film composer of all time, and he's still alive and he's still working. Um, inter- I, I do love classical music. Um, been uh, listening to a symphony, Symphony Number no. Five by Valentin Silvestrov. S i l v e s t r o v, beautiful, brilliant um, piece of music. He's a Ukrainian composer, um, and that's just lovely. I'm I'm a big fan of John Crigliano, who's also who's a film composer, but mostly a classical co- or concert composer. Um, of in the past, you know, composers who I love, like film composers, Jerry Goldsmith, you know. His music is the most brilliant, one of the most brilliant film composers ever. Um, I, I listen to, like, my favorite concert composer is Gustav Mahler. I love Mahler's music. Uh, he died in 1910, but his music is as relevant today. And very few people match the sort of intellectual brilliance of his music, which is not to say that it's not enjoyable on a, just a, you know, just like Shakespeare's plays. I like that analogy because like Shakespeare's plays, especially in its own time, appealed to all levels of audience. People who are the most sophisticated could appreciate the complexity and beauty of his language and the stories. But the common person who may not have been even literate was able to enjoy the stories and the bodiness and the, you know, and, and the drama. So it, 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 I think that's true of Mahler's music. If, if you understand what he's doing and you're just bowled away by the magnificence of it, but you can just listen to it and go, wow, this music is just beautiful. You know, there's just, just gorgeous. Um, so I don't know. Those are just off the top of my head. Those are some of the, um, some of the things that I, been listening to lately that i love brilliant sounds great so for anyone listening those those are the people that should be on your on the top of your homework list um and and just to finish it off i'm just wondering maybe obviously you said about teaching at usc um have you got maybe like a soundbite or a small piece of advice for anyone that listens to this and go that's what i want to do i'm inspired now to to kind of start scoring for film yeah, I mean, it just to just write a, a lot of music, really build your skills. I do. I mean, some people will say, well, you don't have to have traditional compositional skills, but I think the more skills you have, the better, because I mean, whether it's your, whether you're writing the most um, sound design oriented synth scores, being able to also write an orchestral score, um, gives you a tremendous advantage because of all the competition, if you're only, if your niche is very, very small, um, then you're, you're, especially if sound design is sort of like the approach and there's a lot of sound design, especially in television and film. Um, it, and it works ex- incredibly well, but I think eventually the, uh, the, the hardware, the software is getting so good that the, the, you know, the directors and the music editors are going to be able to design their own scores, just sort of like, you know, holding the finger down on a cool sound. So if you don't have real traditional compositional skills, if you can't write a melody and a theme and, uh, and, and harmonies that are beautiful or earth shattering or whatever, you know, you really are at a tremendous disadvantage as, uh, as a composer. So I say, Build those skills, go to school, study music composition, um, listen to the com- great composers of film, TV, games, and concert music, uh, pop music, everything. It's all applicable to the profession now. And obviously, if, if you um, 
want to get, if you really want to pursue it, uh, you might consider the USC program. It's called Screen Scoring at USC. It's, I would say, it's the best program in the world. It's a one-year uh, course for 20 people get in each year. We only accept about um, about 12 to 15 percent of those applying, and uh, it's a very intense one-year program at, at, at the University of Southern California. But you come out of it really, really um, prepared. And with and uh, with a lot of good uh, opportunities to meet people and get get opportunities coming out of the school, oftentimes working for other composers as assistants, etc. But sometimes just you know, if obviously we don't, the school does not provide gigs for you or anything. But you get a lot of um, of uh, contacts that are quite valuable, especially at the school cinema. And this, which includes uh, game scoring opportunities, et cetera. So, so that, I mean, that's sort of like my generalized advice. But there's other programs in the world that are also quite good throughout the U.S. and other parts of the world. So, I mean, just, just do it if you, if you, if you must, but you have to, I think the attitude is, geez, I, there's, there's nothing else I want to do. I have to, I have to do this. And so if, if you're there, then go for it. Brilliant. What a great way to end the conversation. And I just want to give you the opportunity just to remind people where they can keep up to date with you or your new music or your news, that sort of thing, website, Facebook, etc. You can go to my website, which is my name, Gary Scheinman, G-A-R-R-Y-S-C-H-Y-M-A-N.com. And um, I, have, I, I do update it occasionally and sometimes I am a miss and I need to update it, but it's, it's fairly updated, but you can certainly, there's a music page. You can hear a lot of my music and I do in, in when important news events come out. The, the thing about the game industry, especially is that it's so private or, or um, um, it's so um, secretive when you're in the process that you can't talk about anything until it's literally released and the game developer says, okay, now you can talk about it, you know, or, the, you know, and, and, and so it's usually very, at the very end of the process, you can actually sort of say, I just, you know, worked on this cool project. So uh, often the news is old news, something that came out, you know, recently or in the past, but uh, I, I'll, or certainly try to update it whenever I can. I'm, um, I have some really interesting um, concert opportunities in Europe and in, and in China, and I'll talk about those and uh, et cetera. So yeah, for sure, check out my website. Brilliant. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes so people can just kind of scroll down and click on it and get straight to where they want to be. Super. Well, I think we should leave it there, Gary. Thank you so much for your time. It has been insightful. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Uh, learn, learn a lot. It feels like I've just been sat here for forty-five minutes learning everything that you've said. It's been brilliant. Uh, my pleasure, James. Uh, enjoyed very much. Your questions were great, and I, I enjoyed it. So I hope others uh, appreciate it as well. Super. Thank you, Gary. Take care. Bye bye. Well, what more can I say than what a knowledgeable guy that man is? That was my conversation with Gary Scheiman. Needless to say that I very much enjoyed listening to him and having the chance to ask questions about his unbelievably interesting career. Thank you so much for listening all this way. Please make sure you go back and listen to all of the previous episodes if you haven't already. I have had the pleasure of speaking to some very interesting and very talented people. Also, I'd recommend checking out the Spotify playlists that I've published with the top picks from each artist and guest that I've had on the podcast, and the links for those are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, which is at James Ed George, and also like the Facebook page, which is Liner Notes Music Podcast. Thank you very much indeed for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I'll see you in the next one.